thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome and good morning, everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Um, I'm going to start with a different concept, I think, than most that you'll hear uh, around cybersecurity. And um, it all centers around sort of empowering you to protect yourself. That uh, even though we have a lot of this cool new technology like AI and ML, and I'm going to walk you through a bit of that here, um, all it does is automate what you and, of course, everybody that you know can do to protect themselves. So I want to give a few concepts around it. Now, I've, I'm a big fan of uh, Albi here. Uh, I, no, I don't really call him that. That was just made up right now. Uh, but he has um, one of the best quotes out there, which is, if you can't explain it simply, don't even bother trying. You don't understand it. So when you get into conversations with people, I often advise them that if it takes two or three times for them to explain it, they're probably, they probably don't understand it well enough themselves. Don't, don't feel bad that you're not getting it. It, it. it could just be that they haven't figured out how to most accurately and uh, simply present the data. So I'm going to try and do that here, is make it very simple, very straightforward. And if you don't understand it, then it's my fault. Okay? Don't feel bad whatsoever. We'll give it a shot. So what I want to start with is this concept of AI mathematics is actually everywhere in the universe and everywhere in the world. It's in the room around us. It's in our heartbeat. It's in everything. It's in our body, physicality, our physical body. And the best way to describe this and to help um, draw some attention to it is to find a harmony or a rhythm that you see out there in the world, a repetitive something that happens, okay? Typically what a rhythm or, or a harmony is, and you'll find a pattern of some sort, a pattern that can be largely predictable. Now when you find a pattern, you find a natural mathematical algorithm. Now either it's artificial or it's natural, but it's an algorithm that can then be replicated and reproduced and actually built into computers. And when you find an algorithm, of course, you find mathematics because there is no such thing as an algorithm without the use of mathematics. You have to find some common, predictable, repeatable method for it, okay? So by its very nature, if you can find a pattern that's predictable and replicatable, and you can mathematically represent that pattern, you can now predict the future. That's, that's my supposition today. So let's see if I can prove it to you. So first of all, um, I often do a much longer keynote around mathematics and AI, um, but I've sort of condensed it into basically one slide. And you can, you can think of it very simply as this was my epiphany moment, by the way, when I was we started uh, Silence in 2012. I had this crazy idea, and I had no idea how to implement it whatsoever. And the crazy idea was that, um, well, I would get the idea from talking to audiences like you. I'd, I'd actually mostly do hacking demos back then, like 15 years ago. And I would, I would hack into any computer that you had, you know, a MacBook or an iPhone or an Windows. Didn't matter. I would do it. And I'd typically do it on stage live, you know, authorized, of course, you know, not. Not anything unauthorized. Uh, I just followed, uh, you know, uh, a scary guy up on stage here, right? I would do everything clean, legit. Well, at, inevitably, at the end of every single demo, I would always get somebody in the audience, some cheeky fellow, that would ask me the same exact question. And it was always, uh, Stuart, so this is all great and good, and I'm scared to death now. Uh, what I really want to know is, what do you use or run on your computer to protect yourself from people hacking you. You must be a big target. You're the hacking exposed guy. People must would, would love to put you on the mantle uh, of, of successes. And they'll, off, they'll always challenge me. They say, OK, show me your uh, system tray, like right now, and, and show me your processes running. And of course, uh, the very first time this ever happened was uh, up in Rochester, uh, New York, at the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. And it was one of the students there. And uh, I looked down at the front row. And sure enough, um, it was the head of worldwide sales for the company that I had just been acquired by. Okay, So 
my company was Foundstone, the company acquired me, and there's the head of worldwide sales. I thought to myself, okay, either I'm gonna lie to a thousand people, or I'm gonna be the shortest tenured executive of any acquired company out there, right? I'll be fired within weeks, I know this. So I, I sort of came up with a plan, and I'm like, I, I can't lie to this individual. So I said, um, look, I don't need to show you my sys tray or my processes, I'll tell you exactly. I don't run any, any software protection or any security software on my computer at all. And of course, naturally they're like, what? That's crazy, especially because I, I ended up being CTO of that company, um, global chief technology officer for that company, and I would say the same thing every time I would go out there. But I would always tell them, but I'm not 99.9% .9 of the world. I know what not to do and what to do. I, I know that the healthy living, uh, the clean living, as someone called me once, he's like, man, you really are clean living on that computer. Yep, I don't really do anything funky. I'm telling you, it's real simple, real easy, and I, and I don't need to worry about getting hacked. And so I, I would say the same thing over and over again. I explained it over and over again, and they would obviously ask me, well, how? How do you do these things? And I would walk them through it, and I'm gonna tell you in just a second. But when I started the company, I'm like, there has to be a way to programmatically, algorithmically, represent the pattern of me as a security professional. And many of you out there, you probably do the same things that, we, that I do, you're just not even aware of it. So we figured out a way to algorithmically, okay, represent that good decision making before anything ever runs or executes. So that, that was the whole thing with silence. But when, as I was starting to, try and figure out a way, and, and working with my co-founder, Ryan Perma, to figure out a mathematical way to do this, because we knew signatures was dead, were dead. Uh, we had been bludgeoned to death with the lack of signature protection out there in the world, and pretty much every technology has been built on signature tech, pretty much everything. So we're like, we can't do another signature thing, that's impossible, and we have to prevent. That's important, like that's critical. We wanna prevent. We don't want another smoke detector and another, another video camera catching the fire and the burglar. We want prevention of the fire, prevention of the burglary. So as, I, as we started to go through this exercise, and I started to really dive deep into mathematics, and I'm not a math major, I, I didn't get my degree in math, it was, it was really, I love statistics though. And it was fascinating to me how you could actually represent the world in very, very clean statistical formulas. This one popped out at me. So I don't know if you are familiar with the Nautilus shell, or the Nautilus animal. It's a fascinating creature. It's been around longer than just about any multicellular organism out there. And it is incredibly well designed. So every chamber inside the Nautilus shell holds air. And the air is controlled by the Nautilus itself to create buoyancy or decrease buoyancy, or to move left, move right. And it is this structure that has been perfected over millions and millions of years. Now what's really interesting about it though is um, there was a, an old uh, king of Rome that actually discovered that each and every single chamber is exactly 1.08 times the prior chamber. Okay, so that might, that might not seem too fascinating at first. But think about this, it's a multiplication. Nature is multiplying the prior space of the chamber and increasing it just so at 1.08 exactly for every Nautilus shell out there. It's learned that that is the most efficient and effective way of survival to multiply the size of the air chamber in the prior. And it hit me. Nature is mathematics. And that's what we started to find. When I get back into, um, when, I, when I do my broader presentation, I talk about Things like pi. Now we've all learned pi in school, high school, college, whatever. Vaguely get it, generally. Uh, but you'd be amazed at how many natural elements leverage pi itself. So spiral galaxies are defined by mathematics of pi. Ocean waves are defined mathematically by pi, as well as phi. There are man-made structures that, that use pi all the time. It's everywhere and it's almost, um, you don't want to look too deep into this stuff because you start, that's all you start to think about and that's all you start to see. But I will leave you with one thought that I, I'd love you to look at. It's called the golden ratio. 
it's largely based on the Nautilus shell. But the golden ratio is a universal ratio of sequence of numbers, often called the Fibonacci sequence, that predicts um, effectively many objects in, in the world today. So phi, for example, is 1.618. And what you can do is if you take um, every section of your finger and arm, you can actually divide each and every single successive one by each other and you'll get 0.618 or if you times it, it's 1.618, right? These are mathematical elements that are inside of every one of us all day long. And I, I was totally unaware to discovering this. So, so if we know this, if we know that, that nature is math and nature is algorithms and patterns, et cetera, and we don't learn from that, we don't take that and do, it, do something good with it, then we will forever be in this Groundhog Day moment, okay? So this is what, unfortunately, where we are today which is we just want to put more fire detectors out there, right? We want another video camera, another fire detector to catch the fire as fast as possible, as early as possible, as soon as possible. It, but it doesn't prevent anything. So ultimately, you have to deal with the blaze. You've got to um, rally the troops. Hair is on fire. You've got to go respond and react. And it's ultimately this lack of prevention focus is what causes you know, the, the need for the ambulance and the recovery teams and the response teams. And we know that this is, um, this is not a winning formula. Sure, it might keep a lot of people in business and in employ employment, but it's not actually helping anybody. It's not actually moving the ball forward. And so we knew when we started the company that we had to find a truly preventative way of fixing this problem. So let's talk about where the problem really starts when it comes to cybersecurity, at least on the execution side. And I'm going to explain the, the groupings that I, I typically pull everybody together on. First is that you have this set of known attacks out there. Back in my day, when I first started, it was the Morris worm. Like that, I don't know if anybody remembers the Morris worm. I was at the University of Colorado when I saw that thing, um, and I was fascinated, like, you know, just enamored by the thing. I didn't need a girlfriend at that time, I just was studying this thing, right? <laughs> Which is probably a sad state of my life at the time. But at any rate, but there's gonna be a new attack, right? So now, tomorrow, there'll be a new attack. Well, the known attacks, we know. We've been able to dissect it and break it down and figure out what it did and why it worked so that we can create a new signature for it and catch it the next time somebody else sees it, right? That's a detect and respond model. That's what all of cybersecurity basically is. And um, that creates this patient zero requirement. You have to have somebody victimized by an attack before we can protect the rest of the world. So that's why you've heard over the years, you know, information sharing is key, you know, immediacy of, of uh, cloud and, you know, checking in with uh, universal, you know, uh, oracle of some sort, knowledge base. That's why it's always been so key, because it's detect and respond. And you want to get that detection and respond down to a very minimalistic uh, time window. Um, so all of the, this process has to occur every single time a brand new attack comes out that's not been known before, okay? Really, sometimes we call it a zero day attack, but basically just a zero day sort of campaign of bad stuff. And that's what has created all of this, this need for these sacrificial lambs. Somebody's got to take one for the team uh, to, to save the rest. And we know that that is not necessary today. Uh, we didn't when we started uh, the company. So it's Groundhog Day again. So are, are you going to walk out of here and, and think to yourself, well, you know, detect and respond is sort of, it, it's good. It's, it's brought us to where we are um, and sort of move on. Or are you going to think, wait, Maybe there is a different way to actually protect computers through prevention. So let's see. Like, like uh, you know, Albert says, a first form of insanity is to leave everything the same and at the same time hope that things will change. I know we've all been there before. I've certainly hoped a lot of things have changed and never made much effort to make a change. And it just keeps going over and over again. So we want to change things right here, right now. So let me explain, from our perspective, the taxonomy of cyber attacks out there today. The first is execution-based attacks. Now, 
99.9% .9 of all attacks are execution based. There's maybe a social engineering you know, attack that you could say is the 0 0.1 or the 1 or whatever percentage you think it is, but execution based attacks is by and large uh, the attack surface area, which is malware and viruses and worms and trojans and ransomware and APTs and zero days and all these things that have to execute something in a target or victim computer system of some sort. And it's a, it's a very large market, about $10, $10 billion. Second is identity-based attacks. And these are stealing your password, guessing your password, brute forcing your password. Um, the uh, Deloitte hack, right, was identity-based. Whereas the Equifax hack was execution-based, right? It was a web, web attack. And that's about, I always call it about 30% of all of this, the, the attacks by number, by count, um, that are uh, recorded every day. And then you have a third base, which is denial of service. And that's it. And so denial of service attacks, of course, are starving the target victim resource of, uh, of resources and having it crash unexpectedly, either the network or the, the server or the endpoint. And that's pretty much it. Um, that's the surface area. Now, if you look at this, does anybody recognize how this maps to a very common framework that we're all taught in cybersecurity called the CIA model, confidentiality, integrity, and availability? So availability is the denial of service attack. <clears throat> confidentiality is the identity-based attack. And then integrity is the execution-based attack. So you're compromising the integrity of the target computer to execute something that you don't want executed. Something that's bad or malicious is going to hurt you. And so that maps out pretty well to that CIA model. So it's easy. It might be easier to remember it this way or the other way. I don't know. I, I, I think of it as execution identity uh, as well as denial of service. Now, once those attacks are successful in some form or fashion, now the data, you know, leaves the building, so to speak, or, or the knowledge of how to exploit those um, threat vectors sort of uh, is discussed out there in the world. And that's why the, the dark web, you have to think about and consider. If you were to build a security program just on execution, identity, and denial of service, that, that gets you to the 80-20, the Pareto, Pareto principle of cybersecurity. But you also have to think about, OK, what do people already have about us? Or what have they been able to get despite a strong security program in, in execution, identity, and uh, denial of service? So consideration about all of these elements of, hey, are there discussions around exploits of uh, technologies that you deploy and that you run every day? Are there zero days that are, that are being discussed? Are there insider threats? Are there people that are already inside of your organization that are talking externally about being able to exploit um, uh, your company? Um, is your data for sale? That's a simple one. Right? We've seen that a lot. I don't know if I, I got hit with the, uh, the Equifax hack. I'm sure pretty much every adult American did. Um, and uh, that's certainly the biggest place for that data is going on sale um, on the black market. Malware for sale, obviously, um, attack planning, et cetera. So let me give you a few examples of execution identity-based attacks. You've seen a lot of these already. But so WannaCry, right, Petya, um, any of these sort of... Uh, Big, big ransomwares, they're all execution, right? They're getting something to execute on the remote target system, either through a phishing attack or a target attack or a worm-based attack. Um, with WannaCry, um, it actually leveraged a, not a zero day then, but certainly a, a day one exploit that was leaked by the NSA in some form or fashion called Eternal Blue and Eternal Pulsar. And both of those exploited over the network. So got something to execute through the network SMB service port that was running on it. Um, then you have things like execution that are cloud and web-based, like Equifax or CloudBleed, uh, Edmodo. A lot of these are all web-based attacks that are exploiting vulnerabilities or misconfigurations in a web server or some cloud application. Um, you probably heard, you know, LastPass had a hack, you know, Okta, like everybody, they're all they're all going to get hacked at some point, right? And it's all identity, predominantly identity or execution based. 
you heard about, of course, with Deloitte, um, stolen passwords. That was the, the, the scuttlebutt, um, was a global admin password had been pilfered through some form or fashion, either through a phishing attempt or through a keystroke logger. Um, my money's on the keystroke logger, but it could be fish. Um, and then there's malicious insiders. Like think about all of the leaked CIA documents or NSA documents, things of that nature. A lot of people are saying they were insiders. Um, some of them have actually been able to be proven uh, with contractors like Booz Allen, contractor, et cetera. Um, but those are all identity based. So what can you do? Now, I started the program by saying all of this, you know, thinking about AI and ML and applying it to the problems that we're facing today can be, um, can be done by you. I mean, honestly, what we've, we've built at Silence is your brain, is your security brain, a security professional's brain in a box, in a product that thinks securely about everything that goes on. So what can you do even without us, without product? Well, first off, from an execution perspective and an identity perspective, these are the things, real simple, right? Five steps, and when somebody would ask me, Stu, you don't run any software of any sort on your computer, what do you do? I would go through this list. So number one, I don't open any email attachments that I'm not expecting. And even the ones I do expect, I don't open them. <laughs> I will save the file onto the disk and I will open it up in another editor of some sort, like a binary hex editor, text editor, something like that, and I would look for signs of maliciousness. Now, they're really quite obvious to see. If you were to get 100 normal PDF files and you look at it binary, okay, or hex or whatever, and then you look at a bad one, it jumps out like a sore thumb. It looks sketchy beyond words. And anyone in this room, I guarantee you, could pick it out just by looking at it, okay? So second, don't click on links that appear suspicious. Now, I, I don't click on any links, um, just to be paranoid about it, um, in a, uh, a browser, which is full-featured, right? You strip down the browser, there's no JavaScript, there's no Flash, there's no active content that can be run. I used to run, you remember the links text browser? Do you remember that? It was all text-based? Yeah, I used to run all my links in, in a VM on, on links, uh, L-Y and X. And uh, that, was, that was the safest way to go, right? Without looking at it. However, if I had to click on something, I would take that one URL, put it in another tool called, actually it was a um, Foundstone tool that turned into a, a McAfee tool called File Insight. And it pulls down all of the content from that web page and shows it in code format. So just like in PDFs, I would look at every link and I'd say, okay, this looks super sketchy. Why is it going? you know, creating an active X, setting an active X object, when, uh, and, it, and that's communicating outbound to an IP address that I don't recognize at all, and I can't resolve it. So just don't click on links that appear suspicious. Don't plug in unknown USB sticks or any sort of devices like that. Don't reuse passwords. That's like number one, but that's basically impossible, correct? Right? If I told you that you, you were gonna lock, be locked out of every account that you have today, unless you created a unique password for every account that you have today, you'd probably jump off some building nearby, right? Like, it's impossible. But that, that's the way to stay secure. Number one, unique passwords everywhere. Why? Because if you get hacked with an Equifax or a bad one, but you know, something else has their password, it can be cracked easily, they can't reuse that password on your corporate email. But if you keep them the same, that's the way the bad guys get in, right? Um, and then, um, and then the, la the other part of passwords is obviously just keep them, make them long. I, I don't care what you have in them. You can have all spaces if you want. You can have an A with 100 spaces and a B. I don't care, just make it long. That's also very hard, right? Don't use that password because I'm sure someone will use it now in a password brute force. But you get the gist. <laughs> and then just to reduce your social engineering uh, potential, victimization pot potential, you know, I, I know it's hard, but like LinkedIn seems to be like, I get so many requests, I, I just, I feel like I want to accept every single one of them, but I try not to, because I, I want to try to get to know them, or at least meet them, or know somebody that knows them, etc. But even that's really, really tricky. So at the end of the day, that's very challenging. This is what I do, this is what I did do before silence, but this is incredibly challenging day to day. So, 
that all boils down to, hey, if you can um, make sure it's expected and it's known to be safe, you're going to prevent 99% of all the attacks out there in the world. But those are the hardest parts to do that with. So this is how I think of it. Trust, but verify. So first, look at the sender. If it's somebody you uh, know, then OK, fine. They're either going to be something legitimate or they're already hacked up. Right? If they're hacked up, they're sending you something that is the bad guy's intent, not their intent. So if the sender is known, then look at the content. And if it's sketchy, just delete or ignore it. Now the problem is, how do you know what sketchy is? And that's the real trick. And that's why I believe that the um, smartest people in the world don't try to solve problems, they try to prevent the problem to begin with. And by and large, what we've been able to prove with machine learning and AI is that we can actually prevent not just attacks that are known today and that have been known for 30 years, but brand new attacks never seen before in the world ever um, now and in the future. So I'll give you a great example. So WannaCry. So when that came out, of course, my phone was blowing up, uh, probably others in the room too. It was about 3 a.m. and I was getting calls from Europe because Telefonica was getting hit. And the, the panic was, Stu, do we prevent against this attack? You know, and I'm, of course, I don't know. And I, I always freak out too, like, oh my gosh, are we preventing against that? And so within about three hours, we were able to get a sample and test it. Not only did we prevent that one, but we prevent every variant of it two years ago. So what that means is the math models that we created, okay, the algorithmic model that we created two years ago was able to prevent the water cry and every variant therein, or Petya, not Petya, all these. So that means that you could have been on a submarine for two years underwater, gotten a USB from a friend <laughs> underneath the water, and, and get Completely protect, be pr pr completely protected without ever having a, a cloud lookup or an update or anything like that. That's the power of the algorithmic nature of what, what we and others are trying to do. So that evolution is inevitable. Um, I, I really feel like the industry as a whole is all moving towards it. There are some that are more advanced and more um, developed, but everybody's moving towards artificial intelligence and machine learning. The trick is finding those that really have it and those that just talk about it. And the way I like to, to sort of describe it is there is so-called, um, we came across a generations of ML. Uh, we built a white paper that sort of describes uh, machine learning in um, a generation's perspective. In other words, there's immature and then there's mature, just like you know CMM um, frameworks, et cetera. And DARPA has one that's actually okay, but it's just very generic. It's you can do things like describe, you can categorize, or you can explain. The difference between, so describe is just pure signatures, but maybe heuristics, like they're a little bit more fancy, more generic. Categorize is e efforts like taking all the pictures on Google and looking for kittens in the picture. Now AI and machine learning can, can do that incredibly well. But all they can tell you is that there's either a cat in this picture or there's not a cat in this picture. The last phase, which is explain, is, and we can't do this today, is to explain why did you think there was a cat in this picture. A machine can't do that today. So by and large, everybody is in the category, categorized phase. And that is what we call narrow AI, largely. So there are we've mapped out five different generations of machine learning and AI usage today in cybersecurity. Pretty much everybody is in the first generation, okay? That means small number of samples, small number of features, cloud only, they can't do local training, local conviction, easily handpicked human labels, things like that. You're gonna find pretty much I mean, honestly, I, it's probably like two-thirds of all people that claim the AI are in the, the zero generation, right? They're just pure marketing. But of the ones that are saying it, you're probably about 90% are in that one, uh, in that first generation. Second is larger samples, larger features, but they also have local prediction. And you probably have two or three folks that are doing that in the second generation today that at least we've been able to, to see and discover. There might be more. And then third, very large feature set, very large sample set, um, largely um, features picked, however, 
um, mathematically and algorithmically. So not, not just by hand anymore. In fact, most of the, our features, for example, are picked purely mathematically. And then we believe you can ultimately get to supervised local training and then ultimately unsupervised local training. But we believe we're five, 10, maybe 15 years away from getting into the fifth generation. So there's a white paper on silence.com. There's also a video you can check out if you want to learn a little bit more, but that does help you quite a bit. So just in summary, no, you don't need technology to protect yourself, right? But uh, education discipline is just incredibly hard. And it's incredibly hard to do that every single day and be vigilant 100% of the time. So look for those technologies that learn from the past and predict the future using a mathematics-based approach. So with that, hopefully I've adequately described mathematics and ML. And if not, and if you're still confused, it's my fault. So come find me. Thank you very much, everybody.